Hello, hello, Black on Black Education family. We are back with another episode of the Black on Black Education podcast. And we, as always, are asking our guests who they are, what they do, and why they do it. Hi, okay. So, um, <laughs> hi, I'm, I'm Joel Plummer, and I do a lot of things, but no matter what I do, it's, it's all a form of, of, of teaching. So for the past 23 years now, I've taught history at the secondary level. I've taught U.S. history, African-American history, and, and Latino history. And then also for the past 14 years, I've taught in the African Studies Department at Rutgers University, where my primary interest is the history of African-Americans in sports. And then my third interest related to history is, is photography, which I consider uh, writing history with, with a camera. And so all those interests come together uh, to form my, my, my daily work. Got it, got it, got it, and uh, and and that daily work is is so focused on uh, on black children, you know, just like black on black education is focused on it, and, and we want to kind of dive right into it. Um, why is it that so many of our youth are having miserable experiences in school? So, it's not necessarily intentionally designed to be painful, but nevertheless, that's that's the end result. The profile of the average American teacher is a forty three year old white woman. So the question I always ask teachers is, what are those teachers actively doing to make sure that they can relate to the, to the black children in their classroom? Because it's not going to just naturally happen. Either you're not as a, especially given America's largely segregated residential patterns, the idea that, that a 43 year old white woman uh, can walk into a classroom filled with black children and hit the ground running and connect and make this a, an amazing experience without any special preparation is, is laughable. And so what teachers have to do is they have to first recognize that there's a difference between black and white children. And one of the problems that we often have in America, we, we um, as Jeremiah Wright says, we, we think that different means deficient. And when in fact, it just it just means different. And it's obviously different. For instance, this is what I, when people push back on this idea that that black children are different from from white children. I say, look at our historic, a social historical experience. Take my family, for instance. My family's been here at least since the early 1800s. And if you look at my family tree from the 1800s all the way to me, I am the very first generation of my family to be born with full rights in America. Uh. The very first generation. I was born in 1975. And so that is a totally different experience in America. What you, how you see America, how you interact with America, what you still need from America is going to be very different from that white child that is born as, as it's been a full human, considered a full human in America for, for centuries. It creates a, a different way of viewing the world. And so there's no way you just get that automatically. You have to, you have to mm -hmm. take inventory of what you do know about your students, what you don't know, and then make the appropriate steps to, to, uh, to make the change. And yeah. not to ramble, ramble on, let me just add one more thing to that. And, and that's the premise of, of my book. I have this book called Sumo Wrestlers and Supermodels. And the premise is this, is that education and, and curriculum is not neutral. It's designed to take you to some goal. So there's no such thing as a neutral education. And too often what happens with black children is there's a mismatch between what they need and what they get in education. So the metaphor mm. I use is, let's say you have someone that wants to be a supermodel, but their, their trainer is an is a expert in sumo wrestlers. So that person that wants, to be a sum, that wants to be a supermodel eats like a sumo wrestler, works out like a sumo wrestler, 
uh, dresses like a sumo wrestler, has the mentality of a sumo wrestler. So what happens, and that, and that trainer could be the best trainer, sumo trainer in the world. But what happens when that person walks out and in, into, the, into their real world circumstances, when they try to be a fashion model, they try to walk the runway in New York Fashion, fashion Week, it's going to be a disaster. Or even yeah, worse, yeah. <laughs> even worse, you want to be a sumo wrestler and you're trained by someone that's an expert in sumo and, and supermodels. So you're eating like a supermodel. You're dressing like a supermodel. You have the mentality of a supermodel. What happens when you get into that sumo wrestler ring? You get obliterated. And I argue that's what's happening to black children. They're getting an education that doesn't match what they actually need. And so they're getting yeah. they're getting crushed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that what you're saying is is so indicative of this entire conversation that we're having about education right now, because the 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 group of educators in the country that are recognizing that this system is deeply flawed and is not created, nor is it meant for, for black people and people of color, we're recognizing the drastic changes that need to happen. And unfortunately, are getting so much pushback around that. And so I, I really just kind of want to get into the idea um, that teachers can do this work in a substantive way in their classrooms, regardless of the conversation that's happening and the fights and the arguments that are going on about what education should uh, be in America or what should be taught. That, that is, a, is a conversation for another day. I think that what we really want to get into is what is happening in classrooms on a day-to-day -day with individual educators and teachers um, and what can be changed about that experience to make a drastic um, um, 360 in education tomorrow. Right. And, and, and you hit on the, the, the key. We know that there's lots of problems with, this, with the system on lots of different levels, right? The, the funding is, is a problem. That, that's a monster problem in, in, in and of itself. Um, there's not enough black administrators. That, that's a problem. There's huge problems. But those things are massive. When you try to change a massive institution, like a school system, that takes time. But what doesn't take any time is teachers today deciding to change the way they approach their classrooms. And, and again, that was the focus of my book, things that teachers can do right now. And so one of the things that happens a lot, particularly in, in urban schools, is we have to get rid of the perception that Black children are things that need to be controlled. That is one of my greatest frustrations um, over the course of, of my of my career, where you walk into a teacher lounge and teachers are using the phrase I hate most is these kids. And they do that to separate the kids that these black kids are teaching versus the kids in their own neighborhoods. These kids don't want to learn. These kids don't don't want to listen. And so often they're obsessed with controlling these black bodies instead of freeing their minds. And you can't, you simply can't teach children that you're afraid of. It's, it's, it's an impossibility. And a, the, one of my mentors, her name is Vanessa Bryant, great English teacher. When I was a young teacher, she pulled me to the side. And you know, for everyone that's ever been a teacher, you know, the information is easy to learn. The hard part is so-called managing a, a classroom of, of, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40, 40 people. And so I was ha talking to her about classroom control. And she sat me down and she was like, Plumber, there is no such thing as classroom <laughs> control. The students always outnumber you. 20 to 1, mm. 30 to 1. Anytime they want to do something, they can do it. So what do you mm. have to do? You have to essentially make a deal with them. You have to make a deal where you say, look, the educational experience I'm going to give you is going to be so engaging, so empowering, so relevant to your lives that you'll exchange your power for the experience I'm offering you. And when kids act up in a class, that's them saying, ah, this was a bad deal. 
You know, when you have those teachers that can hold it together for the first week or two, and then it then it doesn't then it falls apart. That's the kids saying, "All right, we did the we did the fourteen day free trial of this thing, and now I want my money back. I'm taking my power <laughs> back." And but that first comes, but that's the first thing, right? Teachers have to know their students and respect them as as powerful beings. Mm -hmm. That doesn't take any money. Right. Right. That, that's 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 a, that's a mindset. And then the second thing I always say, you have to know your students. You have to do the work of knowing your students and in two ways. One, you have to know what was the journey that led to that black student ending up in your classroom. You have to know their historical experience because that's going to tell you how they view the world. It's not an accident that so many black people believe in conspiracy theories because black people have been victims of conspiracy theories. It's, it's not irrational to believe that, that government agencies are, are plotting against, uh, against um, powerful black people. Cause we've seen that, mm. we've seen that happen. Right. But if you have no knowledge of, of the, of a black past, when some kid says, nah, I don't, I don't trust the, I don't trust the government. You'll write that off. No. into some, some random paranoia. Yeah. Or, yeah. or better yet, I, I always ask my kids, like I have like 99.99% of my students who are black and or Latino. And I always yeah. ask them, um, how many of you would feel safer with police officers coming in the room? Like the more police officers that come in the room, the safer you would feel. Nobody raises a hand. No. <laughs> All of them would feel safer the fewer police officers there are around them. Mm. You have, as a teacher, you have to understand where that comes from. Right. That's a different world from growing up where you see police officers as, as your savior and your, and your protector. Right. So that's known the historical experience. Giving candy and, and all these different things. Right. If, if that was your experience, uh, if that was your experience, you have to recognize that other people live in a world where that's not the case. And so I think that was a big thing for me, even becoming a teacher. I grew up in a very, very different scenario than a lot of my students. Now, in some cases, we share a lot of similarities and in other cases, we don't. Um, and so I have to be able to say like, oh, that happened to you in the school or, oh, you didn't have this when growing up or, oh, like I have students who struggle with typing. And I'm like, I had a typing class. I'm like second grade, but not everybody has those opportunities. And so I have to say, oh no, we do have to take five minutes for me to show you how I put my hands on the keys so that you can start to figure out how do you type so fast, miss? Because I have been typing since I was in second grade. Well, that, that doesn't mean that yeah. you're bad. That just means that you didn't have this so like let's figure it out now um so i i, I that, definitely appreciate that but that that's the nail nail on the head that's you recognizing who your students are and that's my second thing right know your students past what led there but then you also have to know them now right what are their real life circum circumstances now and yeah. on the first day of school one of the speeches i give my kids when i talk about my expectations i tell them hey look some of you come from places where you need to be aggressive, where you need to have some type of psychological armor that you might have to be have to be a little defensive, that you might have to you might have to keep that 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 mean face on for 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 a while. And I would never tell you to throw that away. Because mm -hmm. obviously that that's helped you survive where, wherever you are. But what I will tell you is that for 45 minutes a day, this is an oasis. And you can hang up your armor mm. and you can be as silly and as vulnerable and as goofy and as nerdy as, as you need to be. And then when the bell rings, you can put your suit of armor back on to go survive um, your, your circumstances. But that's me recognizing, look, I'm not going to try to change completely who you are because part of the reason you act the way you act is because it helps you survive. And I'm not going to throw that away. Um, but let me add some more tools to, to your toolkit and teach you how to use yeah. the right tool at the right, at the right time. But that yeah. comes just, just from <clears throat> talking with students. And I always say for new teachers, my test of a new teacher has nothing to do with, with how much knowledge they have or their degrees. I say, can you have a half hour conversation with your class just shooting the breeze? 
without talking yeah. anything school school related. Because if you can do that, that tells me you know enough about their world to to have a conversation as as humans. And then when yeah. it's time to bring in to make exam to bring in examples to help you know illustrate the points you're gonna you're gonna make. You, I know that you have enough knowledge of their their life, their culture to bring to use examples that they can relate to. Right. But if I put you in front of a bunch of kids and all you can talk about is, you know, what's on page 27, you, you're going to yeah. have a rough year. And they and they rough. realize that you just don't, you know, like it's they're so not interested in that piece. Um, you know, it, it doesn't do anything to. Um, help them see that you actually care. All the things that you were saying, you know, it, it shows that you actually care. Um, and and that is like, that's the cost of entry. If you can't yes. show care from the very beginning, then you can't enter their heads. You can't enter their mm -hmm. hearts. Then you're not going to be a good teacher for them. Um, and so that's just something that we we, we have to focus in on, man. We, we're, we're reading, um, we're doing a book club right now with, uh, um, of Chris Emden's Ratchetdemics. Uh, and so much of it talks about um, black children coming into the classroom and being treated as if something is wrong with them. Um, when they wanna be loud, when they, when they, when they wanna, you know, to, to, to rhyme or when they wanna do things that, that they do at home, they, they enter the place and, they, and, and they're being told something's wrong with you. Now, how, how do they then take that and say, you know what, this is a place that I'm gonna actually enjoy. How, how, do, they, how do they develop a love of learning when you're telling them that, that something is wrong with them. So the, the work that these teachers needs to do is so, 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 so imperative. Um, and it sounds like I actually want to read the supermodels and 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 and, uh, and, and sumo wrestlers and supermodels book because it seems like it gives a fantastic analogy that might allow people to say, ah, oh, I hadn't really thought of it that way. Um, and, yeah. and really open up heads and hearts um, to the fact that th that, that, absolutely you have got to get to understand your students if you hope to be able to teach them and that caring thing is is important you can you can learn the the curriculum you can learn a lot of stuff you could be taught a lot of stuff but you no one can teach you to actually care of, about these these people in front of you these yeah. kids in front of you that like we we can't teach that and 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 i see that all the time with with new hires i i look people up I can tell within 30 seconds, it's like, nah, this, this person's not gonna make it. Cause you <laughs> cause you can tell they don't have a heart for for for, for these kids. Like teaching's yeah. not a job where it's not like a some factory job where you can disconnect your brain and to be like, all right, I'm just gonna get through it. Nah, you, you if you there's a chance that if you give a kid a horrible experience, you can derail their whole life. You know, you could shake the their their confidence for the for the rest of their life. Especially yeah. kids that don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, adults reinforcing the, the goodness in them, and if you come yeah. and you you break some kids kids spirit, like that's not some random widget that that you that you broke. That's a whole human life that you you've messed up, and so you you can't play around with the, with this teaching thing. Yes, yes, and I think like <laughs> even for me, people are like, why are you always ready to fight? I'm always ready to fight because I understand that my students deserve a lot better than what they're getting. And if you are somebody who's going to be in a space with me, unfortunately, we gonna have to fight if you think you're going to be in here giving them a subpar education. Like, it's going to be a problem. And that's because I recognize what that does when a student doesn't understand their power, when they don't understand their brilliance, when they don't walk around in the world realizing that they can be something, they end up being exactly what you figured they were gonna be because you set that up. You set the conditions for that. Nothing right. about their DNA, nothing about their skin color, nothing about where they come from set that up. You set that up. You made an expectation that that's who they could be or what they could be and then let them run the rest of their life believing that. And our job is to stop them from believing that what society says they are is what they are. They are who they want to be and what, they, and what they're going to be and how they can be if we foster that. And so I think that, that all that we're saying right now is that individual teachers, students are never going to 20 years from now come back to the reunion talking about some, remember the way that so-and-so taught Pythagorean theorem? Remember that? No, no one's ever gonna do that. But they are gonna say like, I remember how excited I was when Miss Free got engaged 
because I knew that like she had been working on doing this for herself and she was trying and she was always checking in on what I was doing. And like I remember how she made me feel. Feel. Yep. And so I think it's so important. Like what we're saying right now is that it's not to say, oh, hang up the boots, don't pay attention to all the things that are going on in the world and what needs to be changed. No, we're gonna do that too. But you can't do any of that if in your own classroom students hate you because you don't know who they are. Absolutely. And I have a chapter in the book that says just that about how you make students feel like when 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 students say, like, I don't like such and such teacher. What they're really saying is, I don't like the way that teacher makes me feel when they say I like this teacher. They're really saying I like the way this teacher make makes me feel. Yeah. And and that's that's critical. Like, like I don't remember. I had a, a favorite teacher in high school. His name was Mr. Pannone. I don't remember exactly what Mr. Pannone taught me. I know it was history, but I do remember how I felt going into that class every day and how yeah. and how amazing I felt interacting with him and the way he ran, ran the class. And I got the knowledge. It's, it's there. I didn't forget it. I just don't remember mm -hmm. you know, specifically what's connected directly to him. But I remember mm -hmm. the experience that, that he, he gave me. And students will always remember how you made them, how you made them feel. And, uh, and, and about teacher responsibility, you know, I was on a, on a different show and someone heard my, my spiel and they were like, yeah, all that's good, but we're so busy. We're so overworked. We don't have time to do extra stuff, blah, 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 blah. And I always say, Hey, look, at the end of the day, if, you deliver a poor experience in your classroom, your students aren't going to be like, well, that's okay. It's not your fault. You were given a bad curriculum and you were, you were overworked and you know, you, you didn't have enough prep periods. And so we, we forgive you. All they're going to say is, Oh, that teacher was horrible. That's it. And, and it's all, you're going to be left holding the bag for that bad experience. And so I always say, if that's the case, then, then step up and do whatever you can inside your own classroom to change the experience. And that might mean, and I have a book, uh, a chapter in the book about managing up. That might mean you have to have a little bit of courage and buck against whatever the curriculum is. Yeah. And that's fine, right? If you get in trouble, but it's effective, make someone drag you before a board of education and right. say, hey, Mr. Plummer's method worked great. Right. But it, it's not what we had planned out, so I want to punish him. Right. Yeah. And see how that works for you. It's step up or step out. Like you got a choice. You know, you you can you can step up and do the things that are needed to be done for these kids, or you can leave. And and that seemingly that's a a major part of of what needs to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the overall industry, you know, set, setting up some type of system. I don't know exactly the specifics of how you do it um, or, or if you've given some thought to this, but but removing the teachers that are just have an unwillingness um, to, to become culturally responsive to our students. Have you um, have you wrestled with that at all? I haven't thought of a specific system, but but I absolutely agree. And, and I think especially at urban schools, we get in this mode that it sometimes it seems like we're just happy to have a body. And, you know, it's so hard to find teachers that it's like, all right, if we get if we get a body, we'll we'll we'll, we'll settle for that. We'll settle for that person. And we have to I think we I think the focus needs to be on how do we actively get good teachers um, yeah. rather than. So let's try to get good teachers from the beginning so we don't have to we don't have to uh, deal, deal with the bad ones um, later on. But that, that's a bigger problem because you're talking about, well, we really need to pay people more money to make the job more attractive. Um, school districts really need, especially urban school districts, need to have a budget to be able to go recruiting. You might have to, especially if you want, you want black teachers, you, you might not have them at your local schools of education. You might have to travel down south and, and go shake some hands of, of, of people in person and, and talk to people about this this profession and try to get them in. So we're gonna have to be pro proactive about creating a the next generation of of, of good black black teachers instead of just yeah. you know hoping that we can find some. 
big big shout to the uh, Center for Black Educated Black Development. Black Educated Development. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then even to what we were talking about before as it pertains to like this, this, I don't have enough time. There's too much going on. I haven't overworked it. I'm not denying that because I feel that on mm -hmm. every level. But which one's more important? That's your it. principal being happy because you put the lesson plan in on time or your students <laughs> engaging with the knowledge and making sure that they are doing what needs to be done in the classroom as it pertains to learning your content area while also learning themselves. Which one's more important? And I am so grateful for just, what is, this is about to be like episode 71. I'm so grateful for all the conversations I've had with educators because it's helped me learn from y'all careers and what you all learned along the way. And so I'm in year one and two and three, like I'm already recognizing the fact that like, I'm gonna ask for an extension because in my class, what's happening is more important than me submitting this to you. And so if it's not submitted to you, I'm gonna let you know, hey, we're doing this really, really cool project. It's taking a little bit longer. It's taking up a lot of energy and I really haven't had the prep to do it. Can, I'm, can I get this to you at this time on this day when I know I'm going to have an opportunity on this time at this day to work on it? But right now I'm just really entrenched in making sure I give valuable feedback to every student on the on the first essay. What principal is going to sit there and say, no, I need my lesson plan? Right. Absolutely. And if a principal does say that, that principal cares more about his or herself than, than the kids. And, and, his or and that's who won't even be reading it. Yes. Yeah. Because let's be real. How many of y'all are really sitting there reading page by page, giving feedback to the teacher and handing it back to them? That's another episode. But and, we have I mean, we have to be real about it. True. Yep. And and here's the other thing about doing the extra work of getting to, to know your students and and redirecting your, your curriculum so it meets their, their real world needs. It might require some extra work in the beginning. But once you do it, your your whole life, your whole career is gonna be easier. And and yeah. often, as messed up as it is, when I'm trying to talk to to white audiences about about why they should should care about culturally relevant education, the the moral pitch doesn't work. That that look, this is good for the children. This is gonna give them a better educational experience. But when I flip it, I say, hey, and it's going to make your life better too. It's going to make you more effective. It's going to make your classrooms not going to be chaotic anymore. Everything's going to click. Then they're like, oh, okay, there, 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 might, there might be something to this. Right. But it's a win-win. It's definitely a win-win. And, and it, I mean, it actually brings me into the next thing I wanted to ask you around. We, we talked about the, 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 the power that teachers have to kind of jam up somebody's spirit and, and, and ruin their lives. Um, let's talk about the other side a bit. Let, let, you know, let, let's talk about when they um, apply some of the principles that you're, that, that you're talking about, like what that does in terms of energizing a child's life and sending it in the direction that we all wanted to go and that, that better um, for them that you're, that you're talking about as well. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I, I tell teachers all the time, especially people that aren't teachers yet thinking about going into teaching. I say, look, the only reward for this job is that sincere thank you you get for the, from the student who says, hey, you know what, Mr. Plumber, you changed my life. I'm going to do this, this and that be, because, because of you. Like it's, if you're for teachers, like that is the eternal high that you're always chasing. All right. It's, that's what keeps you going every every morning, no matter what's going on, no matter how many pointless staff meetings you're in, that those those sincere thank yous, that the, the sincere gratitude that kids have for being put on a path where they can do what they want with it, want with their lives. Like it, it's intoxicating as as a teacher and for, for other students. It encourages them when they see like, OK, wait, this this thing can can actually work. Uh, you, you listen to this teacher, you do this, you do that and, and things happen. Um, it's it's what it's all about. Hey, the, the reason mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason why I'm on this show today is because one of my former students um, 
she was a diamond in the rough when she when she first came to me. But I could tell that she was brilliant. She's not going to like me talking about this. Um, I could tell how brilliant she was. But mm -hmm. she was also um, quick to punch someone in the face um, who needed who needed some 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 correction. And she would get into some of it was her fault, but some of it was just bad luck. She would get into all these these circumstances and I would keep encouraging her to to fight through it all, fight through it all. Like you, you you're you're something special. And and it started to click. And then she it clicked by senior year. She was senior class president. Um, she ended up she ended up going going to Howard. Now she has this professional career and she has been emailing um, different shows around the country trying to trying to get me on as as repayment for for sewing in, in into her life. That's amazing. And it's like I tell it like like that's the teacher equivalent of, of, of an Oscar award. Yes. That full circle. Yes. Oh, I'm I'm so excited for those moments. I, I, I really I can't wait for them. And you get some stuff already, though. Like, you know, it's, it's I, I'll just do a proud papa moment. You know, like Eva, you know, she talks to me about what goes on in the classroom on a, on a regular basis and, and the frustrations <laughs> with, you know, what goes on in, in school. But the kids absolutely positively, you know, they they, they are drawn to her um, because she has, you know, an, an infectious personality like her father. Um, <laughs> and because I'm like the same age as them. <laughs> and, and, and look, and we don't. It, and look, those kids are going to be the army that pr also protect you when when mm. powers that be, if they want to give you some nonsense that messes up your class and you have to and you have to fight back and you need someone to stand with you. There's nothing more powerful than than having your students stand stand with you. Yeah. I remember when I was younger, we did a we did a walkout for for a teacher who um, I think he wasn't going to get tenure or something to that effect. And unfortunately, it didn't necessarily work. But we you know, we it, it got co-opted. But, you know, but it it, it uh, I, I have heard of other situations where students were the voices that kept teachers in the school building that otherwise were not going to be allowed to stay. It forces the people in power to say to literally say, I don't care what these kids want. Right. I don't care what these kids mm. think. Uh, well, I'm doing this anyway. Right. And if, and if you thought you had bad behavior before, once you give them that message, huh, wait and see what happens then. And so I I am so grateful for just where this conversation has is going. And I think it connects so well to what we talked about in the pre-call, right? So before we are on air, before we're live, we're talking about the fact that students feel held hostage in school buildings. I know I did. Mm -hmm. I know there were certain class periods that like, I didn't care if I was late every day because it was not a place I wanted to be. That 43 minutes was sucking the literal life out of me. And so we have students in the classroom 180, about 180 days a year. And so what can educators start to do in their classrooms, regardless of their discipline, regardless of what they're teaching, to really start to, to change that narrative and to change the way that, that students feel in that space? I think we've talked about it a little bit, but very specifically, what are some of the things that educators can begin to do so that students don't feel like they're being held hostage in a space, even if it is a content area that's not their best or they don't particularly sure. enjoy? There's a simple question that, Every teacher should be able to should be able to answer um, for anything they're 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 teaching, and I have this rule in my class: any student at any time, no matter what I'm doing, can say, "Hey, Mr. Plumber, what does this have to do with my life right now?" Mm. <laughs> and if I can't answer that, then I say, "All right, you're right. We need to do something else," because everything we're learning should have some real world connection. And you as a teacher should should know that going into the lesson. That should be one of the reasons why you're doing the lesson. Because, all right, we need to learn this because this is connected to this part of their life right, right now. That doesn't mean that you can't learn some, some stuff that you're going to need in the future. But you should be able to articulate why it's important to that student right now. I remember I had, mm -hmm. I remember, remember 10th grade geometry. And... I someone asked a class. We asked a question, simple question, like teachers 
always get, why, why do we have to study this? And, and the teacher was just like, eh, it might be useful someday. And I'm like, I know I'm going into history. What, what is this? Then years later, years later, um, one of my former students went to Rutgers, became an engineer, decided that he didn't want to be an engineer, decided he wanted to give back and become a teacher, became a math teacher. It's dynamic. And I asked him the same question. Now, what, what's, what's the point in, in this math stuff? And he's like, plumber, it's not math. It's solving problems. It's learning how to logically solve any problem that's placed before you. And that simple twist was like, oh, okay. And, th yeah. and same thing with, with English, right? It, we call classes like, like English class. But I, and I say, well, what if we rephrase it? What if we say this is actually storytelling class? Because mm -hmm. stories are powerful. All day we tell stories. You, you want to get that scholarship? Well, you better tell that interviewer a story that, that, moves, that moves them. You want that job? You got to tell a story that, that moves people. You want that, uh, you want that <laughs> upgrade to, to the first class, first class seat? Got to be able to tell a story that moves people. Like stories are powerful. That's what politicians, the best politicians do all the time. They tell you a story that, that, that moves you. So now, all right, we got to study Shakespeare. Yeah, but why? Because at times there's, there's some of those stories are masterful storytelling that, that can move people. And if you learn how to tell stories like this, you can get people to do whatever you want. It's not just, you're not just learning for the sake of it, just because it's there. You can use this as a skill that you can use in real life. And if that's the root of everything, if you can always uh, bring whatever you're teaching back to how is it going to affect my kid right now this afternoon, you're going to be in good yep. shape. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I love it. So I want to I want to go to the uh, Joel Plummer School for a little while. Like you know the the, the you 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 created um, you know from the beginning cool. to the end. Like walk walk me through you know maybe a day of 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 all of the intricacies that that you know that you would kind of add and make sure that students have to you know have to have to work through so that they get the type of education that they deserve. All right, I don't have a full plan. But I will say these are some of the, the major changes that need to happen. One of the things I argue and I argue in the book is that the design of school needs to change. We need to be realistic about where our kids are in life. Too often, schools' guidance departments are just scheduling centers, right? That's the place where people get, get their schedule they're not actually, and, and by the way, these guidance counselors are actually highly trained counselors and stuff, but they have 200 kids, 300 kids, four, 500 kids on their, on their caseload. You don't get to know or deal with anyone um, when you had that many people. My wife is a therapist. She would never accept a hundred clients at, at one time, especially clients that go through trauma. So first thing that has to happen we have to revamp that guidance department. And instead of it being a, a ancillary thing uh, on the side, it, it has to be a centerpiece because it doesn't matter how good of a math teacher you are, how good of a history English teacher you are, if the children are depressed, if they're insecure about, about where they're gonna live next week, if they're physically insecure about, about their safety, if they're not straight, emotionally and psychologically anything you try to teach them is an uphill battle so in my ideal school with with, un, with an unlimited budget um i'm going to have this guidance department be a real guidance department where they actually know the students and deal with their real life stuff that's that's first first and foremost um and then the other thing is this there's a delicate balance here when we talk about school safety. I get the idea of metal detectors and security guards and stuff. Um, sometimes things things happen, but there's a there's a balance that we that we need to have because you got to think about it. And I have a quote from a book from the in the book from a principal in Boston. 
He's a he's a white vice principal. And he says every day his first job is to stand at the door and usher the students, his black students, through a metal detector. And he said, I can't help but to think that the first message I send to every child every morning is that they're potentially dangerous. And I get, listen, and I live in a small town, but sometimes things pop off. And and sometimes that can that can bubble over into into the school and some things need to be checked. But I say, all right, if we have to go through this thing where you have to get wanded and, and checked and all that, once you get in the building, we have to make it a paradise that balances that that first experience out. Right. We know where where and this is where that that giant guidance uh, piece comes in, where where we actually in, embrace you like family, because there's this myth that lazy teachers have where they say, look, I'm not here to be your mother. I'm not here to be your this, 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 that. Yes, you are. My ideal school, we we replicate the family and anything that a child is missing, we fill the gap. Oh, you don't have food. We fill that gap. Oh, you have no um, social emotional support. We fill that gap. Whatever, whatever gap these children have, school needs to school needs to needs to fill it. And we have to be realistic about that. This whole I look, I already, I got my education. I'm here to teach this stuff. And if you get it, fine. If if not, whatever. I got my degree. I'm just here for this content. All that's gone. That's not going to work oh, in the 21st exactly. century. Do something else. Yeah, right. right. We we literally have to that that whole cliche about the whole child, but it's 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 true. And we have to step up. And it's and you're right, and, and teach us, well, where are the parents? Blah blah blah. You know what? You're right. It would be great if every child had had loving, engaged parents that, that were involved all the time, but they don't. So unless we're gonna throw these kids away, we right. need to step up. And fill those gaps. I mean, I've asked people several times. To, you know, this is like, you know, so wait, whose responsibility is it? Like, you know, if, 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 if we say, if, if we know that there are going to be parents out there that, you know, they they they're they're unable or unwilling um, to take care of their responsibility, and and the next question is, whose responsibility is it? Um, the, the only place that it could possibly fall on, you know, in the social hierarchy is the is the school and and if we don't answer that question then then we're, we're asking for the breakdown of communities and society at large because we, it, it's we're, we're letting so many people just fall through the clack cracks because because we're, we're, we're throwing our hands in the air and saying that's not our responsibility that's not a reason but then it ends up but then it ends up being your responsibility when somebody's in jail or it ends up being well, your responsibility back, yeah. when someone when, <laughs> when 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 somebody needs to apply for food stamps or child care or all of these different programs that we have in our country and not to say that those don't need to exist that's not that's not mm -hmm. at all what's mm -hmm. being said here what's being said here is that if we are not going to answer that question with whose whose job is it to make this happen recognizing that in white communities and black communities and latinx communities and indigenous communities there is the same breakdown across these communities then we could talk about class and the breakdown there but our we have to recognize the school as the cornerstone of our community we have to start to to fund it as the cornerstone of our community. Yes. There are places where money per person is spent higher in a prison than it is in a school. That's all places. CEOs make more money than teachers. Make it make sense. What are we investing in? You're right. Young people say houseway, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and no, I don't think they say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and and know what else is crazy? As a teacher, that's the best part of the day when it's when you're connecting on that human level and dealing with with the real stuff. Like I teach history as a vehicle to get to those points where I can have those deep conversations about what's really happening in in your life. That's the most meaningful part of the day. When when I think back on my career, I don't ever think about some lesson I, I, I taught. I think about the conversations I had with kids after school or at lunchtime 
Um, that's that's the real work. And it's the most enjoyable work if you let yourself do it. Um, it's it's literally the best part of, of the job. That, that might be my favorite thing about virtual learning, the chat. I save the chat every single time. When you see the things that students say, the questions that they ask, what they're asking each other. We had kids in our Zoom chat the other day create a Zoom to have an after-class party with each other. I was like, no, ma'am, like this is, a, it's a, they want to learn. They want to engage with each other. They want to do all of these things. If you set it up in a way that makes it applicable to their lives, applicable to the people that they love. And even further, they just reckon, they just want to make you proud because you see them as brilliant. If they like you. If, if they like you, if, if they don't like you, they could care less whether they make you proud or not. And, and uh, you know, it, it, once again, it is our responsibility um, not just to, to, to pick them up, you know, as, as whole human beings, but to, to, to make an attempt to develop the type of rapport where a student is going to like you um, and be open to learning from you. So. Um, I mean, we, we've we've thoroughly in, enjoyed this conversation, Joel. I feel like we, we're going to need to have like a part two or something like that, man. This has been really, really good. A lot of part two conversations lately. True story. True story. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I guess the, the the there's two things. So one, um, the last question we we always allow you to become the interviewer. But before we do that, uh, we want you to let everybody know exactly how to get in touch with you, um, how to support your work, um, and let them know. Sure. The, the easiest way to find out um, about any of the work I'm doing is, is my website, which is which is my name, Joel Plummer, J-O-E-L-P-L-U-M-M-E-R.com. JoelPlummer.com. That has links to everything that links to my to my books, uh, to my photography work. Um, every everything. Everything is there. My my uh, my Instagram on my social media. It's all at Joel, joelplumber.com. Okay. And, and please, people, go 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 buy the book. I, you know, I, I, I have not read it yet myself, but I can tell, you know, as a result of this conversation, it's something that you want to uh, you want to take a look at. And please engage with Joel. Um, so, so, Joel, now it's your turn. You got any questions for us? Um, really, just one. Um, what have you taken? So you're, you're on episode 71. And I'm curious about the knowledge that that you've you've gained. Um, is there a consistent theme that um, keeps popping up in in all the discussions that that you've been having? Uh, I guess I'll start. <clears throat> um, well, the, the consistent theme is that we have the answers. That 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 the the answers to these challenges exist. Like when we start to it's this big puzzle. And in, in, I think it's still 71 episodes. If we just plucked out, you know, puzzle pieces and we put them down, we, we would have the answers to, to all this. We might not have the money to do it, but, but, but the answers would, um, would, would, would be there. Um, and foundationally is one theme is what you talked about. You, you have got to start from a place where children come to school and they want to love, they, they, they come to school wanting to love, they come to school loving learning. Yep. We have to develop a, a, a method with to keep them loving learning, as opposed to squeezing and choking out um, that 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 feeling for them. So that that that's probably the biggest theme that I can recall. And then I think for me, it's like the one that I feel like came top of mind when you asked the question, which was a brilliant one, might I add, um, is that our children are in indescribably brilliant like just it like it there's no words and for that amount of brilliance to come out of <coughs> a space or be recognized in a space where just like my dad said there is a choking of who they are and who they can be I think that it's incredible that year after year, educator who's been in the game for 25 years um, are able to recognize the same thing. It's not stopping. The students aren't getting to a point where they quit um, pushing their educators, pushing their teachers, pushing for people in our communities to hear them, to see them, to believe in them. 
Um, so I think that that's the, that's the biggest thing is that emotional connection that every educator that we've had on this podcast has really recognized the importance of their role as educators, whether it be in the classroom or outside of it, as well as the resilience of, of youth in our country and how, and how powerful our education system can and will look when we start listening to them. And y'all, y'all are motivational. I, I have tomorrow off and I, you, you got me pumped up. I wish I was going to work tomorrow. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. Uh, I'm ready to get back to it. That might be the best right? compliment we've ever received. <laughs> right? right? I'm, I'm a let go of a day off. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so, I mean, there's no better place to end. Thank you so much for taking time to create space with us. We enjoyed this conversation immensely. Y'all might see uh, Mr. Mr. Plummer back on the Black on Black Education podcast to keep the conversation going. Uh, but we are super, super grateful for you joining the space with us. Thank y'all for listening and we shall see you next week. Thank you.